So now, now we'll move in to the, the next talk for this afternoon. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Paul Bonahani Ajayi. He is currently well, the interim dean and the, the associate dean of the graduate programs and an associate professor in the School of Social Work at Memorial University in Newfoundland. He is a public speaker, a trainer, an educator, and a researcher in, in areas of social justice, anti-Black racism, critical race, critical whiteness studies, and anti-colonial theory. Dr. Ajayi is the author of multiple publications, including co-authoring the book titled Emerging Perspectives in African Development, Speaking Differently. In his teaching praxis, Dr. Ajayi takes an intellectual and political stance that challenges, exposes, and subverts colonial hegemonic knowledge and practices. He, pro he provokes critical thinking and challenges learners to not only think outside the box, but in fact, to disrupt the box. Dr. Ajayi's research and scholarship draw on anti-Black racism theory, critical race theories, critical whiteness studies, and anti-colonial theory to ask new questions, as well as to identify potential answers to what W.B. Du, du Bois describes as color, the color line problem. In Euro-American, Canadian, and African society, he draws on African indigeneity as a rich cultural source of knowledge to reimagine a new future for social work education. His topic today is posted on the screen is Indigenous African philosophies as critical thinking pedagogical tools for post-secondary education. We welcome uh, Dr. Ajayi. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hans, for uh, this uh, wonderful but also gracious uh, introduction. Uh, you know, moments like this remind us that we are where we are because we stand tall on the shoulders of our ancestors. And as part of my tradition, I always start my public speaking with land acknowledgement. I respectfully acknowledge that I am a guest to the lands on which Memorial University campuses are situated. And the lands are in the traditional territories of diverse indigenous groups. I acknowledge with respect the diverse histories and the cultures of the Biotic, Megma, Inu, and the Inuit of this province. Uh, land acknowledgement means different things to different people, but for some of us, it is a reminder of the history that have created this space and also the generosity of the indigenous people in creating a path for some of us to be here. It is also a reminder of the personal and ecological cost that owners of this land have paid in order to make a way for us. And as I'm often reminded by my African elders, when the river goes, do not deny you fish. You also do not deny them animal sacrifice. Uh, this proverb in many ways speaks to our collective responsibility in making sure that we work together to make this place better than we find it. So even as we engage in this uh, scholar, you know, scholarly work, uh, part of what we are doing is holding each other accountable and also making sure that we create a new path in the form of education that will help change the way we have come to understand the world and live within it. I am very grateful to uh, Dr. Veronica uh, Waruru and Nora Langat for the honor of the invitation. Uh, today, I am hoping to engage in these discussions about indigenous African philosophies as a pedagogical tools for post-secondary education. This presentation called to the critical examination of the structure, use, 
and the purpose of indigenous African philosophies as contains in Proverbs, symbols and storytelling and how their formulations and uses represent a valid understanding of how to engage the mind and the body in the complex and nuanced way. In particular, I seek to examine what particular teachings of indigenous African culture that are emphasized through proverbs, symbols, and storytelling, and how such teaching can be engaged to enhance critical thinking education for diverse learners in post-secondary education. I am following the definitional work of Agrawa, George Day, and others, and other indigenous scholars in conceptualizing indigenous knowledge as a body of knowledge associated with the long-term occupancy of a certain place. It is a knowledge that is informed, shapes, guide, organize, and regulate how people come to know about themselves, their world and place, and their place within that world. Indigenous knowledge emerges from the collective voices, experiences, history, cultures, and worldview of local people over generations as a result of sustained occupational occupation of or attachment to a place. Such body of knowledge exhibits a great degree of sophistication, complexity, and abstract conceptual thinking and knowing. African scholars such as Abdi Nokwesi Redu of Ghana, Odera Oruka of Nigeria, uh, Jeke and others have insisted that indigenous African knowledge is a form of philosophy because it elicits deep critical reflection about the world and human place in it. Indeed, indigenous scholars such as Raven Sinclair and you know, Marie Baptiste have uncovered the ability of indigenous knowledge to help learners develop critical consciousness of moral values. Johnson's work among the Ojibwe people of Canada reveal how indigenous mythology contain rich, complex, and dense philosophical thinking. Similarly, in African context, Shinwa Achibi, Aikwe Ama, Ngugi Wathiongo, and others through their literary works have demonstrated the importance of indigenous African philosophies to carry the wisdoms, histories, values, and the cultural knowledge of society. In contemporary times, uh, scholars like George Day and also in my own work have shown how indigenous proverbs symbols, music, poetry, rituals, legend, legends, and mythologies are critical literary expression that carry the values, cultural generalization, and philosophical precept of traditional Africans. In effect, this body of knowledge constitute collective traditional philosophies that cannot be conveniently dismissed. Drawing on such body of knowledge can enhance critical thinking education in post-secondary school education. Critical thinking is about investing in knowledge that allows room for reflective assumptions and interpretation, bearing in mind that there is nothing like a singular truth in knowledge production, validation, and dissemination. Critical thinking is a useful educational tool to help learners to critically examine hegemonic knowledge that oftentimes masquerade as a universal knowledge or common sense. The importance of critical education in post-secondary schooling is to influence and en encourage a way of knowing that provides complex reading of societal problems. Such understanding of critical thinking lies well with indigenous African philosophy. And as I was you know, preparing this paper, I was reminded about you know, uh, the famous or the infamous words of you know, Professor Trevor Rupert, when, then, who was then the chair of the history department at Oxford University when he was asked about teaching African history. And his response was, what history? Perhaps in the future, there will be some African history to teach, but at the present, there is none. There is only the history of Europeans in Africa. The rest is largely the history of pre-Columbian America, darkness, and darkness is not a subject of history, unquote. Trevor Roper's words form a pattern of Euro European and North American education tradition that deliberately dehistorized Africa, not only to erase any traces of Africans' contribution to the world civilization and progress, but also to rub off 
people of African descent of over 500, over 5,000 years of rich legacy and the, and the heritage left to us by our ancestors. However, we can also be guided, especially in a meeting between on land over land claim between a First Nation uh, community in North, Northwestern British Columbia, Canada, and the government officials. During the meeting, an elder asked, if this is your land, where are your stories? This question helps us to understand that every land has its own story. Therefore, the responsibilities of critical African scholars is to search for the stories of our land and and to use those stories to push back on scholars like you know, Trevor Ropez, who think that Africa has no history. So it is within this context that I want to engage in some work about some of uh, Africans, indigenous African symbols, uh, proverbs and storytelling, and, and, and the rich pedagogical knowledge embedded in these stories and how it can be used to embark on critical thinking. Adinkra symbol, as oftentimes you know, known in a, you know, is an element of ideographic and pictographic writing system that existed in Ghanaian society for generations. They, ref they reflect the historical core of Ghana as a nation, as well as the cultural more communal values, philosophical concepts, code of conduct, and social standard of Akan people of Ghana. As careers of cultural memory and wisdom of Akans, a Dinkra symbol serve as a major source of education for Akan children. Although many people are attracted to a Dinkra symbol for their entertainment and artistic values, the symbol presents something more. Hidden in them are coded proverbial expression, riddles, stories, histories, social, political, and spiritual commentaries intended to teach, encourage, discourage, counsel, caution, and guide the actions and inactions of the living. The coded messages are expressed philosophically to depict religious, social, political concern, as well as to reflect on issues pertaining to beauty, morality, and other high values. Adinkra symbols is an example of the patient and skillfulness of indigenous Africans to set proverbs or verbal statement into a visual forms. So let's look at the first symbol as we are looking here. We call it a sine tetrema, meaning the, the teeth and the tongue. And the teeth and the tongue mutually perform functions that are central to human development and survival. The tongue tends to uh, turns the food around for the teeth to chew properly until it is ready for swallow. However, in performing these interdependent rules, the teeth occasionally or accidentally bite the tongue during the chewing process. This accident does not lead, does not lead to the tongue abandoning its responsibility by refusing to cooperate with the teeth. Instead, the tongue continues to display its role in the digestive system. In fact, the Akan elder speaks of the expected cooperation and mutual in interdependency between the teeth and the tongue in the Proverbs, a sene tetrema in acida, if it's a woman in the meaning the tongue and the teeth do not own each other appreciation because they rely on each other to function. From the Akan perspective, Cooperation in the interest of, of survival and self-preservation is a matter of common sense and that those who espouse these virtues requires no praises. When we look at the pedagogical relevance of this symbol, the symbol is used to teach the importance of harmony, cooperation and interdependence among people who share common interests. The symbol reminds us that disagreement may arise in any human and social relation. However, such disagreement need not divide us permanently. Instead, we must seek avenue of addressing differences, even in moments of tension, conflict, and disagreement. Now, uh, I will skip in terms of how educators can use this symbol in terms of a pedagogical school, a pedagogical tool, and maybe talk about the last symbol and, and, and use it as an example. The next symbol is what we call the Funtu Funafu Denchen Funafu, or the Siamese crocodile. This, as the image above clearly shows, Siamese crocodile have two hairs, two tails, four eyes, eight legs, and eight feet. 
yet they share one stomach. This symbol also carries an Akan proverb. Funtu funa food den chen funa fu, woma fu bomu ba kun, nan su didi ano o kunhum. Loosely translate, semi crocodiles may have one stomach, yet they fight over food. The irony here is that both crocodiles eat into the same stomach. Therefore, regardless of who is chewing the food, they both benefit from it. However, greed and selfishness distract the Siamese crocodiles from seeing the bigger picture that they both eat for a common purpose. The symbol, the symbol metaphorically portrays the paradox of human greed and self-centeredness that sometimes rob of our ability to see the logic in collaborating with those who share our common interests. Just as the fighting over food can delay the satisfaction of Siamese crocodiles, there is always possibility of losing grounds that easily could have been gained if people with common interests have acted in, in cooperation. The symbol suggests that whenever human interests intertwine, intertwine cooperation, sorry, whenever human interests intertwined, Cooperation rather than competition may be the key to gaining further grounds. In today's competitive global market, where the culture of individualism and competition is the norm, it is easier for us to act with self-interest and preservation in mind. However, the metaphor of the Siamese crocodiles teach, teaches us that the self is not always autonomous. Sometimes survival and self-preservation require cooperation with others. The next symbol is called Marty Messier. What I hear, I keep it. Symbol, this is a symbol of wisdom, knowledge, and prudence. And it goes with the account proverb, which loosely translates, in the death of wisdom, abounds knowledge, thoughtfulness, and prudence. This symbol speaks to the importance of balancing knowledge with thoughtfulness, prudence, good judgment, and discretion. Akans believe that life issues are hardly clear and concise and oftentimes present to us in a messy, complex, and nuanced ways that require prudence, thoughtfulness, discretion, reflexivity, pragmatism, and good judgment to make sense of them. Therefore, acquiring information about something it's not sufficient to make wise decisions unless one also acquires the virtues of prudence, thoughtfulness, good judgment, and a deep sense of discretion. And Aristotle called the term practical wisdom that encapsulates the coded message in Martin Messier's symbol. For Aristotle, practical wisdom is best displayed when actions are informed by reason, observation, vision, humane, prudence, and practicality and non-rational and subjective knowledge. Indeed, Aristotle's articulation of practical wisdom is also shared by Sternberg, who equally sees practical wisdom as the ability to balance, weight, int integrate, and coordinate action ethically. In a way, the metaphor of Matimessia symbols teaches us that in human society, where life issues can be ambiguous, uncertain, and messy, Decision-making must be reflexive and thoughtful. In such environment, a wise decision-maker possesses discernment in knowing what to consider, intuition to detect the infable, semiotic skill to read the connotative, and good judgment to make sense of this within a context. This is what Aristotle described as going beyond both common sense and, pre and present science to grasp the dynamic structure of our rational knowing and doing, and then formulate a metaphysis and ethics. Matimai C.A. symbols stretches the importance of pondering over issues before taking action. The symbol demands patient, wisdom, discretion, and discernment to resolve any issues that confront us in life. The symbol implies that knowledge without self-control, discernment, and discretion, information can be dangerous to the holder. The next symbol is what we call the nyansapo, the wisdom knot. The wisdom knot is a type of knot that on the surface may appear simple and easy to untie, 
but can pose complication to anybody who rush to untie it, especially if the person does not start at the right point of the knot. The symbol carries the Akan proverb, Kwasia into me in Saninian support, which loosely translates a fool can never untie the wisdom knot. The symbol points to the complexity and messiness of life issues, which mostly require prudence, patience, and intelligence to unravel the solution. Those who have been quick to approach a problem without due diligence have often find themselves complicating the problem rather than resolving it. Kwajo Okra described wisdom not as a symbol that demands insight and a profound intelligence to understand the true meaning of people's action. Wisdom not warns us against accepting things on the face value. As such, reaction can result in errors and misjudgment about issues that one has limited understanding. The symbol demands patience, wisdom, discretion, and discerning in, to resolve any issues that confront us. Pedagogically, the wisdom not convey the idea that those guided by wisdom have the ability to make prudent choices to attain their goals. Given that wisdom not is tied through multiple layers, it requires discerning minds and critical thinking to understand, appreciate, and untie wisdom not. The symbol espouses the virtue of critical thinking in solving any problem. Many people who have rushed in life to make important decisions have regretted later when all the facts were made available to them. For the accounts of Ghana, to act prudently and wisely is to avail oneself to all available options and their potential consequences. The next symbol is Sankofa symbol. And as you know, Sankofa simply means return for it. And as depicted in the pictograph above, a mythical bird is moving forward while its head is leaning backwards to pick an egg. The egg represents the cycle of life, which itself is a gem, or in the context of Adinkra symbolism, is the knowledge and the wisdoms of the past. The Sankofa symbols carries an Akan proverb, which literally translates, there is nothing taboo about returning to that which is forgotten. Coded in this Sankofa symbol is the message that because the past entails the wisdom and the experience of ancients, the present search for knowledge cannot exclude ancient wisdom and experience. In speaking about Sankofa symbol, we are reminded of the astute words of Vergis that history is always ambivalent for the place it gives to the past is equally a means to open the way for the future. History is very important to every society and people. And here we should recall the often repeated you know, slogan during the apartheid regime, which simply goes like, goes like this. Our struggle is the struggle of memory against forgetfulness. The South African slogan suggests that African struggle is a mental issue. It is a mental crisis that was created because we were made to abandon our history and our cultural knowledge. And a, a typical example is what we just you know, uh, heard from uh, Professor, uh, our, our, uh, our just, uh, you know, Dr. Uh, sorry, I've forgotten the, the name has you know, slipped me, but he presented about the importance of you know, eco-philosophy and, and uh, you know, uh, Dr. Bua, eco-philosophy and the danger that we find ourselves in our society because we have abandoned our cultural knowledge and tradition. Kofi Awuno, writing in general about African education system, notes that many African educators live in a contradictory life. Although we boast of our indigenous values, we, our lifestyle openly denounce and reject these values. Sankofa symbol teaches us the importance of history in human and societal development. He, human experience is a continuum, the past, the present, and the future, that the past cannot simply be buried and forgotten because it weighs continuously on the present and the future. Andrew Latest, who is an indigenous scholar, argues that the images of the past is a poetic and metaphorical way to extend the identity structures and the values of the past in the present. As we have seen in the Sankofa symbolism, 
The leaning back of the bed is to pick something while moving forward. It demonstrates that the past is needed to recreate the future. Returning to the past is also not necessarily a journey towards uncritical glorification of the past, but rather the realization that the past has a role to play in fashion modern solution. And this is the metaphor of Sankofa symbol. Now, in general sense, this is how we can introduce some of this symbol. As an educator, you can introduce a symbol to students and ask them to think about the images and what it carries. We can then invite students to discuss among themselves what they make out of these symbols. We then open the discussion to the broader classroom. The discussion can cover the name of the symbol, where it comes from, and the meaning students can make out of the symbol. Then the educator can share the context of the the context and the meaning of the symbol to the class. Students could be divided into groups to debate about the importance of history in human and societal development. Then educator can you know, point, provide some pointers to students about the pros and cons of the importance of history. We can then assign students to do research on their own cultural background to identify symbols and stories that speaks to the value of history. Then the student can you know, present the assignment in the following class. Let me quickly point out to some few African proverbs. Again, proverbs are not limited to Africans or to indigenous communities around the world. We know that different cultures and groups you know, have proverbs. But here are a few proverbs that I have you know, uh, identified as a part of engaging in terms of how proverbs could be used as for critical thinking education. This one is from the Zulu people of South Africa, which have a proverb that points out that no polycat ever smells its own stings. Literally, these proverbs explain the everyday practice of polycat. This carnivorous animal has very offensive anal smell. Interestingly, each polycat usually smells and disapproves the annals of the polycat and ignore the fact that they also have similar smelling. The Zulu people call it coined this proverb to suggest the tendency of people to ignore their own defect while zealously accusing others of their defect. This is a lesson about humility of admitting to one's own fault before pointing to others. Again, there is also a saying that when, one, when, when you are standing at the edges of a cliff, any step back, any step backwards is progress. We understand this proverb to mean that sometimes the most effective ways to look for answers is in seemingly unsolvable situation is to pause, step back and critically reflect on one actions as one think about the next action. In the face of danger, one does not rush into decision making, but one takes time to evaluate options before taking actions. The next proverbs also you know, talks about the wood hen. The beast, when it digs beneath the tree in good faith, it does not flee when it sights an intruder. So, abua de adrimpa tutu diasia unrani su hunu nipa. This proverb refer to the works of wood hen, which is always digging beneath trees. And that digging is supposedly in search of lost eggs. However, the good intention of wood hen cannot be taken for granted because it is also an agent of distraction. As the proverb suggests, the rare intention of wood hen can fairly be predicted when a you know, can, can be fairly predicted from his demeanor when he sees an intruder. An intruder, sorry. As members of society, we often use the statement good intention as an excuse to justify wrongdoings. But this proverb teaches us that while, while good intention cannot be faulted, how we respond when others point out the unintended consequences of good intention will determine if we are being sincere. Do we simply put brush aside when others point out our mistakes or do we take steps to right them? Yes, when we dig beneath a tree in good faith, we will not run at the sight of an intruder. In other words, if we did things genuinely with good intention, when others point you know, the, the negative consequences of our action, we do not take offense to that. The next one is saying that it is the forest bed and not the best of the grassland that is pardoned for not knowing rice is edible. Again, 
Rice is the most popular edible food you know, for bears that lives in savanna areas. Unfortunately for bears you know, in the forest area, rice is not often grown in the forest. Therefore, bears, grown, who, bears who lives in the forest area have to rely on other plants and fruit as their main source of food. Therefore, it is, an under, it is understanding when a bird hatch and raise Sorry, therefore it is understandable when a bird which was harsh and raised in the forest area insists that it does not know rice is edible because it was not you know, raised in savanna area where rice is grown. However, the same excuse cannot be said of a bird that was harsh and raised in a grassland area where rice is cultivated. It, in a metaphorical sense, there is a sense that a stranger could be excused if they pleaded if they pleaded ignorant of a community norms, values, and culture, but the same cannot be said of a person who was born and raised in the community. In other words, the accounts believes that claiming ignorance of one's own culture, values, norms, and worldview is no acceptable excuse that has to be tolerated. Let me just end up with this story about, you know, the bed and the policies of identity, the, the bat and the policies of identity. Now the bat is, uh, you know, presumed to be a canine, uh, you know, animal. So, uh, you know, because uh, in the animal kingdom, when the animals, uh, you know, decided to have their own farm, at the time that you know uh, bears were farming together, uh, they were, you know, they were weeding to start planting. They invited the bat, and the bat insisted that, look, if you look at me. I have teeth. Is there any bird that have teeth? And therefore, I am not part of the bear's family. I am a mama. So the bird, the bat was excused. When the bears, you know, finished planting and the harvest was ready, the bat went to them and said that I am so sorry. I have realized that actually I am, you know, I am a bird because I have wings. And the, the bears allowed the bat to enjoy uh, the, the harvest with them. But then when the, you know, the, the next season, when the, the bears were, have, you know, were planting again, the bat insists that it, you know, it wasn't you know, a bear. So it went among the animal kingdom and you know, uh, you know, uh, identify itself as an animal. But then when the animal kingdom were also ready to plant, the, the bar suddenly realized that after all, it was not an animal, but it was a bird. So it went back to the bear's kingdom, but this time the bears rejected him, rejected it. It went back to the mamas and the mamas also rejected it. That is why we say that the bat always hung you know, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the sky because it is neither part of the mama kingdom or the best kingdom. This you know, story is often told to depict the policies around identity. It is oftentimes not so much about what we are. It is what we answer to that is so important. And the story speaks to the complexity, multiplicity and the fluidity of our identity. It is true that no one is one thing. Therefore, the issue is not about the right to choose a particular identity. The problem is when we choose an identity and are unwilling to answer to the responsibilities and the commitment that comes with the identity. This story is often told to challenge us to think broadly that it is not simply what we claim to be an identity that is most important in, but our willingness to commit to the responsibilities that comes with that. We use this proverbs, this storytelling in general to invite people to think in a broader sense. So for instance, how do we claim the identity of Africans in the diaspora? How do we understand and conceptualize African beyond eight boundaries? These are important questions for us to double in. But the bottom line is that when we claim to be Africans, are we willing to also work with, with the responsibilities and the commitment that comes with that? As we often say that one is 
Africa, not because you were born in the continent Africa, but because Africa was born in you. There's something called the blood memory that one carries with you as part of your African identity. But it's also crucial that as we talk about identity, we recognize the responsibilities that comes with that. In, in conclusion, we, we can all see in, in a broader sense, the way in which the philosophical you know, wisdom and the richness of cultural knowledge embedded in African symbols and proverbs. And there are multiple ways within our education system where we can draw on this knowledge to enrich critical thinking. So in many ways, when you know, Trevor Ropa was talking about Africa has no history, indeed, these symbols, these proverbs are a clear demonstration and manifestation that we have always have a rich history. It is therefore our responsibility as contemporary educators to bring this knowledge back into the classroom to show how it can be used to enhance critical thinking. Thank you. I will end here and open myself for questions and comments. Okay, well, thank you so much. You're a lot, a lot to think about and a lot to absorb in a short time there. Uh, I would just start out with a question. Could you expand on what you said at the very end or that one should integrate these, these images, uh, proverbs and stories into uh, the various classes to enhance critical thinking? But what kind of classes do you have in mind? How would one integrate them? Uh, and just give some examples of how, how this could be implemented in a practical uh, post-secondary school setting. No, no, thank you very much. So for instance, uh, let's look at you know, our history class. Uh, how do we talk about history in a broader sense? No history as limited to, let's say, talking about European history or American history, but how American history is connected to uh, you know, uh, other, other parts of the world in, in a very global sense. And then we can, for instance, use the, uh, the symbol of Sankofa uh, as, as an entry point to engage in that discussion, where we use this image as an entry point where we invite students in terms of what do they think about this image? You know, what comes to their mind, you know, and, and allowing students to describe this image will also, in terms of opening the conversation for us to think in a broader sense, the importance of history in understanding contemporary experience. For instance, there's sometimes a sense that the way, the manner in which our education system is structured, uh, students can be physically present, but they are emotionally and psychologically absent because sometimes the curriculum do not really speak to their material experience. So uh, using this symbol, for instance, for a student of an African ancestry, help to guide them in terms of the richness of, of, of you know, the wisdom that is embedded in this symbol. As I mentioned that this symbol itself can entail a philosophical thinking because you know, indigenous people use this symbol to carry rich cultural knowledge about the importance of history in, 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 you know, in, 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 in cutting the new path uh, for the future generation. So it's not just limited to one class, but it can be used across. So for instance, we can use you know, some of these symbols to teach cultural values to teach moral values. There are multiple symbols. So these were just a selected you know, symbols that I presented, but within the within even the Akan culture, the Ghanaian culture, there are over 500 Adinkra symbols. So it depends on what kind of you know, uh, you know, message that you want to carry in the class and the context within which you want to use it will require what kind of you know, symbol that you could use. But I'm saying that it could, this symbol could be used as an entry point in starting conversation in broad range of issues. Okay, uh, any of anybody of the uh, uh, of the presenters here want to join in? Uh, go ahead, go ahead, Brian. Um, thank you. I, I and, and as um. As you're presenting, I, I was I was actually thinking, um, have you 
have you ever used these symbols in in an in an American class? Um, they, they are great for you know for teaching Africans you know about their culture. Um, but if you have used them in an you know a class with with Americans or you know with some Americans in them, um, what has been the response? Um, if that Okay, I, I am in Canada, so I've not used it in American context. Oh, but I've used, <laughs> sorry, I've, I've used it in Canadian context. And I think that, yes, uh, uh, students have really appreciated and, and sometimes they are just, you know, shocked. Because the truth is that, for instance, that the Incra symbol is very, very common uh, on the internet. And this time, people are using it even as a tattoo. Uh, they are using it, you know, as jewelry and, and, and another form of artistic expression. And so them even understanding the, the philosophical meaning embedded in that even made them more, you know, appreciative in terms of exploring further in terms of how can they even use this symbol in a broader sense to engage in broader conversation? So for instance, uh, uh, when it comes to issues around conflict resolution, I've used uh, uh, some of this symbol, for instance, the teeth and the tongue and the teeth as a symbol to engage in a broader conversation around uh, uh, conflict resolution. I've also used the, 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 the symbol of, you know, uh, the, the Siamese crocodile to also engage in a broader discussions about how do we build an inclusive society, uh, given you know our differences, and and how do we also talk about differences in a way that really make difference. So there are several ways that I have used, and uh, the response have always been very positive. But the point is that I always use it as a way to start the conversation and take it up to link it to the broader curriculum. Thank you. Okay, I'm uh, looking uh, for questions to arise. Oh, here we go, here comes one. Okay, uh, a, a long question, that's fine. Thank you so much for this work. It's from Michelle uh, McElhaney. Thank you so much for this work. My dissertation argues for exactly what you propose, the transformation of the colonial project of quote, school through the elevation of indigenous African epistemologies in all content areas. I specifically work with Yoruba Ifa divination, divination divinatory and literary tradition. So the questions are, can you please talk about the challenges of using sacred oral literature in a system that seems to only value the written text? And the second question is, what do you think about decontextualizing symbols, rituals, etc., cetera, uh, from the, their original context? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, um, this is a very important conversation you brought up. I, and I think that, first of all, I want to start with this notion around, you know, uh, the sacred oral literature and, and the danger uh, it presents when they are put in written tests. Uh, indeed, when, when knowledge is put in a written test, you know, uh, it becomes uh, sort of uh, permanent. But part of the oral tradition is also to allow the speaker uh, the opportunity to add to their voice. But there is an element that some of us are, are also coming up with a contestation that perhaps we are only thinking about written text from the way we understand writing and that the symbols themselves are part of how indigenous people capture their philosophical thinking in a symbol form. So we should also begin to see the symbol itself as a form of text because they are visual image that carry stories. And so far as we understand the oral, oral stories and the context that come with those written texts, it becomes really important in terms of engaging the class. But the, the, the challenge that you present, you, you raise is also the danger of bringing this knowledge in academic environment that believe in ownership. Because these symbols belong to the community, and you are right in terms of some of these symbols, you know, and this, you know, uh, element of you know a sacredness to that. So when we are bringing to the, the the school environment, who claim ownership of such knowledge? 
who claim you know, authorial control or discursive right over this knowledge? These are some of the questions that are present to us in terms of how do we bring this conversation within our, our university environment where we have a system in place where the university work with this idea of you know, ownership of knowledge. And, 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 and part of what some of us are talking about is per, perhaps not to move with the idea of you no know, ownership as you know claiming authorial control over indigenous knowledge, but rather we, we see it as a custodian. You know, we are custodians of this knowledge and therefore we can't claim ownership. Then the purpose of our work is to share the knowledge with others and not to claim ownership because the knowledge belongs to uh, the community and to the people. Yeah. Uh Thank you. Let me push you a little bit on that because one of the things is if you just introduce a symbol or a proverb or a, a story, but in its African context, that symbol is part of a large number of, a whole system of symbols. And the proverb is a part of a large repertory of proverbs. So what do you think about introducing one symbol or one proverb without giving the context, the larger context within which they're embedded in the African context? Thank you very much. And I think that that is the, the, exactly the concern that we have in terms of the, the context of you know, the context that comes with those symbols are as equally important. So when we, you know, introduce this symbol with out of context, it, th there is a missing piece because then the learners are not able to appreciate the value that comes with these symbols and even the, the embedded proverbs that it, it carries. So for instance, when right now, when we see what is emerging, that's a, you know, an emerging path in, in North America, in particular, both Canada and US, when you go on the internet, the, the Adinkra symbol is of everywhere. People are using it at, you know, uh, a tattoo parlor. Uh, people are using it in, in jewelries and others. But what is missing out is the, the cultural context that comes with this symbol. And, and decontextualizing it presents a challenge to us because not only do, is there an element of you know, loss in translation, but even there is also an element of you know, people misinterpreting some of this symbol and use it in a way that it was not culturally intended for that purpose. So yeah, I mean, I agree with you that it is a big concern. Okay, uh, we have one more from, from uh, Michelle again. Uh, she said, yes, and how do we prepare teachers to work with African epistemologies? and answer by considering oneself as custodians. And then she says, thank you very much. So. I, I think that the starting point is for us to include it in the curriculum. And, and uh, you know, in the, in the actual presentation, although I didn't uh, uh, go through that, each symbol I identify, you know, seven to eight steps that educators can actually use you know, can follow if they want to introduce the symbol uh, to begin a conversation. So I, I think that uh, we have to introduce it, it into the curriculum, but also there must be an effort for us to learn the historical context and also the cultural context within which these uh, symbols are evoked and uh, also the proverbs that comes with that. But we have a responsibility as, as, as an African scholars, as we invested uh, and, and research into our cultural knowledge to bring this knowledge in our contemporary education as a way of you know, presenting it as a valid ways of knowing uh, and also to challenge the manner in which Eurocentric you know, knowledge system has become a hegemonic form of knowledge in, us, in our education system. To also show that there are different ways of knowing and, and indigenous African philosophy are valid way in which we can view the world and act within it. Okay, uh, are there any other, any other questions? 
Yeah, uh, go ahead, Veronica. Um, is there anybody else who wants to ask a question? I don't want to um, hog you know, the, the speaker's attention. Um, yeah, when you're talking about um, these um, symbols, this, this tradition of symbols being out, you know, in, in tattoo parlors and, you know, being part of, of jewelry, I, I'm, I'm wondering what you think is, um, what is your opinion on this indigenous cultural property rights for, you know, lack of, of a better term, um, that you have, you know, all of this, you know, um, indigenous, they're actually in, indigenous property and they, they're being commercialized and again, without any context, and I think for the most part, even without attribution or whatever attribution that is given to them is erroneous. Um, what are your thoughts on that? It is very concerning. Uh, uh, um, look, this is part of the challenge of even, I mean, for, for those of us who do this work in terms of what are the pre, you know, prevailing danger that we intend to cause as we are even highlighting more on this knowledge. Because on one hand, we want to use this knowledge as a pedagogical tool, but there also the fear is that the more people become familiar with this knowledge, there is also the tendency to uh, uh, commercialize it, you know, and, 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 and indigenous people who are the creators of this knowledge have no benefit from that. It, it is a problem and I wish we have a solution. But again, that has always been the pattern of Eurocentric education system where we appropriate other people's knowledge, make it on our own, and sometimes, you know, claim ownership where even when indigenous people themselves try to use this knowledge, they are accused of, you know, a copyright violation. And so uh, I think that part of the conversation that we need to have in a broader discussion is what are the peril and also the cost of bringing some of this knowledge in, in the academy and using it as a critical thinking tool? Because there is no doubt that the more students learn about the, the richness of the, of the values embedded in this knowledge, the more they are also likely to take it to another level of marketing it. And I've seen instances where students and people, as soon as they get to know this knowledge, start using it on t-shirts. And, and that is why I provided some of these examples, you know, how it has now been used. All because they have suddenly find the meaning, but there is no element of indigenous people getting anything in return. I wish I have, there is a solution to that, but it is a problem. And, and also to add that it's even becoming troubling now, some of the Hollywood movies have these symbols. So this is how far we are going. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, and, and I know it's not just in, in, you know, in African indigenous culture, I know with um, the um, indigenous um, Australians, mm -hmm. they, they have a lot of their, you know, cultural artifacts being mass produced in, yeah. in, in yeah. Indonesia and Bali and then um, sent back to Australia and sold yeah. to millions of tourists yeah. as um, authentic um, indigenous culture. And the indigenous people are not benefiting from these um, yeah. reproductions. Yeah, I mean, uh, not only uh, China is appropriating uh, Ghanaian, you know, cloth, you know, uh, you know, cloth and, and, and using some of these symbols and, and making a lot of money. Uh, perhaps th th there must be a way in which uh, uh, African leaders who engage in this conversation, you know, maybe we should take, you know, cue from what, you know, uh, uh, indigenous, you know, Australian used to talk about that, nothing about us without us. And, and I think that if there are cultural values that there is any material benefit that we are supposed to gain from this symbol, uh, people of African descent deserve to have a bite, you know, about, about whatever is accrued from that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, if there are no further questions, uh, thank you very much. You've stimulated a lot of ideas here, and uh, we'll have a lot to think about going home tonight. <laughs>